Self-centered, careless, greedy, vain, reckless, short-tempered, crafty, pompous, horny, and on top of that, violent. Words you usually wouldn't associate with the hero of a long-running shonen manga. But this passage, said within the pages of the story itself, describes one of my favorite protagonists to ever grace the magazine, Dark Schneider, and the incredible series he hails from, Kazushi Hagiwara's legendary manga, Bastard. Bastard is a somewhat unsung hero of Shonen Jump Weekly's Legacy series. Since its start in 1988, it's amassed an impressive 30 million plus sales and books over its 27 volume run. Bastard has carved out quite the reputation for itself, receiving two anime adaptations, a classic 90s OVA from AIC, and one which is ongoing and about to receive its second season from lead-in films and Netflix, two home console video games, drama CDs, spin-off novels, lore and data books, and more art books than you can count. The series has gotten all the merchandise you'd expect from a Shonen Jump franchise, and it's still celebrated today as one of the best manga to come from the late 80s Shonen boom, at least by those who are familiar with it. Because if you live in North America, there's a good chance that you might only recognize Bastard by its name, or perhaps not at all. This is due to many factors, but the main two are its initial mixed bag of an English release from Viz in the mid-2000s that only ran up to its 19th volume, and oh, just the little fact that the series has perhaps one of the most insane, massively inconsistent publication histories in the entire manga industry, being tossed from magazine to sub-magazine, and back again through its nearly 30-year run, ending with the series being put on permanent hiatus since 2010 with no indication of ever returning, giving it the second longest hiatus in the history of Shueisha publications, sitting right behind Nana which has been on hiatus since 2009. And yes, that is longer than any of Hunter x Hunter's hiatuses. So aside from a handful of art books, a couple cameos from Dark Schneider and other shonen crossovers, there he is. and some on and off merchandise, Bastard had been way out of the public spotlight for over a decade, until last year when a brand new anime adaptation from Lead In Films would begin airing on Netflix. And even then, outside of Japan and France, the anime didn't garner quite as much attention as it could have. Though even if it's safe to consider the manga basically over, it's carved out its place as a somewhat unfinished classic. And I still believe Bastard is absolutely worth your time. In fact, I consider it to be one of the best manga that I've ever had the pleasure of reading from Shonen Jump's wide catalog of series. It's a manga that proudly flaunts its two key inspirations of heavy metal music and Dungeons and Dragons, referencing and name-dropping more heavy metal bands and artists than you can count, and perfectly capturing the feeling of playing a campaign run by a buck-wild DM. Bastard is goofy, and I mean firmly tongue-in-cheek goofy, to a point where the series is a borderline parody of action manga in general that still finds ways to keep its readers genuinely invested in its wild cast of characters. That's right, before Kentoki showed up, there was another Silverhead protagonist already treading that ground. Bastard's tone and self-aware style also manages to avoid becoming grating, due to the excellent balancing act it pulls off, still hitting all of its dramatic beats correctly when the story calls for it. Bastard also pushed the boundaries when it came to raunchy and sexual content that you could show in Shonen Jump, going so far in places that it eventually led to the series creator, Kazushi Hagiwara, and his art team, to release Dojinchi and official hentai tie-ins, showing an angle of the series that was too far for the magazine. Volume releases even added uncensored genitalia in later acts of the series. On top of that, Bastard has a level of plot twists and side information only rivaled by the likes of the Zeno series, making this one of the few Shonen Jump manga I can think of that requires homework and outside reading to be done to get the full 100% appreciation for just how ambitious the series gets. From its near-dictionary-sized collection of lore, to its shift to a more philosophical tale based on Abrahamic religions, that takes a look at the struggle of humanity itself. Bastard is thoroughly insane, but so genuine in the contents illustrated on every page that it's hard not to fall deeply in love with and respect its ambition of moving from a D&D and heavy metal influenced romp to having chapters open with entire Bible verses to set the tone and theme of said chapter. Kazushi Hagibara's evolution as an artist is something to behold as well, with the charming but clean and very 80s artwork of the early stages of the manga, making the way for nearly every page to feel as if it belongs in a museum. I do not exaggerate when I say that Hagiwara's attention to detail and obsession with perfectionism is comparable to the likes of Takehiko Inoue and Kentaro Mira. Hell, many of those in the anime and manga industry, as well as a ton of voice actors, credit Bastard as getting them into the dark fantasy genre to begin with, a year prior to Berserk beginning publication. This video isn't a full retrospective, but more of an overview on why Bastard is still worth your time. What makes the series work so well, and Hagiwara's very unique career as a mangaka, along with the series' very unusual production history. 
Throughout this video, I'm going to be using the localized names featured in the recent Netflix anime for a majority of the cast and locations. This is mainly due to the fan scanlations and the official Viz translation of Volume 1 through 19 being inconsistent with their choices of localized names. Plus, the official subtitles for the lead in films in Netflix anime are consistent throughout and reasonably close to the Japanese names. That is at least for the one arc of the manga that that anime has covered. But before I get deeper into the series itself, and what the broader franchise consists of, I have to talk about how the series came to be. Along with its bizarre and complicated publication history, as well as the reason behind its unique style that still feels fresh to this day. And this all starts with the manga's creator, the free-spirited perfectionist Kazushi Hagiwara. Kazushi Hagiwara is a mangaka that you may not be too familiar with, but the man has quite the reputation in the world of mangaka themselves. From the apparently insane parties he would throw in the late 90s on a regular basis, to a signature loud rotation of heavy metal albums always blaring from his office while he worked, to being close friends with Yu Yu Hakusho and Hunter Hunter legend Yoshihiro Togashi, and being the reason Togashi met his eventual wife, in the equally iconic Legend of Shoujo manga and creator of Sailor Moon, Naoko Takauchi. Hagiwara is tight with pretty much the entire late 80s and early 90s crew of manga artists, and he's been very open about the borderline rock star lifestyle him and his team, the aptly named Studio Loud in Session, lived throughout the 90s. And even stepping outside of manga as a quick example, Bastard is the series that Guilty Gear creator Daisuke Ishiwatari credits as the central influence on the popular fighting game series style and presentation, as well as the design of many of its characters. There's many mangaka who wear their influences and personalities on the sleeve of their series, but few are as obsessed with their own personal tastes as Hagiwara. Born in 1963, Hagiwara, like many kids of his time, found a common interest in manga such as Gonagai's Devilman, when he wasn't busy ditching school or riding motorcycles across the country. Hagiwara was a real delinquent when he was a kid, but around 1985 he would graduate from Tokyo Designer University at the age of 22, having become tight with fellow up-and-coming artist Hirohisha Suruda, who would later publish their own manga, Natsuki Crisis. During his time at university, Hagiwara had also been training under the infamous hentai artist Dirty Matsumoto, who he would work under as an assistant, improving his understanding of anatomy and panel layout, and gaining a love for the raunchy and overtly sexual. After graduating, Hagiwara would move on to be the assistant of Shonen Jump Weekly artist Izumi Matsumoto, working on his series in the magazine, Kimagure Orange Road. As a side gig, Hagiwara would test the waters for his own potential series, in the form of a rom-com one-shot, Binetsu Rogue, which appeared in the Shonen Jump Summer Seasonal Special in 1987. The seasonal specials being a quarter yearly release, often hosting one shots and other special smaller scale previews of upcoming manga. Binetsu Rogue ended up scoring extremely well with readers, finding itself rated first place in the summer special one shots. Not wanting his momentum to slow, and with Kimagure Orange Road approaching its finale, Hagiwara thought it was time for him to submit a one shot that could potentially be expanded into a full series in Shonen Jump Weekly. He settled on an over the top, Dungeons and Dragons and heavy metal inspired dark fantasy story focused on an evil wizard named Dark Schneider. Wizard, Lord of the Fiery Explosion, would become one of the highest rated one shots of 1987, and with its success, he'd put out one more one shot in 1987 Virgin Tyrant. But the start of 1988 would see Hagiwara greenlit for a full series run, and out of all three of his one shots, the choice for which to go forward with as a full series was obvious. Picking up right from where he left off from with Wizard, keeping the one-shot as a canon chapter zero, and renaming the series Bastard, the destructive god of darkness. With this, the first of Bastard's four story arcs would begin, the Dark Rebel Armies arc. Fifteen years ago, the evil, all-powerful wizard Dark Schneider was defeated by Prince Lars Ol' Metallicana and the priest Gio Noto Soto of the Kingdom of Metallicana, but prior to his death, Dark Schneider cast a resurrection spell forcing Priest Soto to seal away his soul in the body of a baby named Lucian Renlen, who was raised alongside the daughter of the priest, Tia Noto Yoko. After a 15-year calm, the former army of Dark Schneider, led by his four generals, the four divine kings, the ninja master Gara, the thunder empress Arshne, the dark magician Abigail, who would serve as this arc's central villain, and the ice wizard and Dark Schneider's former right-hand man, Kal Su, set out with the goal of resurrecting the 400-year-old god of destruction, Anthrasax in hopes of wiping the slate clean with an apocalyptic event and making a way for the creation of a new utopia. The seal, keeping Dark Schneider hidden within the body of the now 15-year-old Lucian, is forced to be unlocked with a virgin's kiss. Yoko's to be exact. Now with the resurrected Dark Schneider awakened, the fate of the world is in his hands. Or at least it would be if he actually felt like doing anything good, because the wizard's mind is still set on taking over the world for himself. The series starts out with this fairly simple, if comedic, heavy metal-inspired fantasy story, before it spirals out of control in a manner few series would even dare to try in later story arcs. The Dark Rebel Army arc would run in Shonen Jump Weekly for a fitting 69 chapters, from the start of 1988 to the fall of 1989. 
When it comes to Bastard's reputation and general representation in both anime and an outside view, the Dark Rebel army arc is what most people think of. Despite the fact that it's only comprised of a year of the series' overall run, and only seven and a half of the 27 volumes that make up the series in total. Part of this can be pinned on the series' shaky release schedule in the following years, and the fact that a good chunk of the series' side content would mostly be set during or before the Dark Rebel army arc. Even the current lead in the film's anime only goes as far as covering up to the end of this arc. But that's soon to change as the season 2 is coming this year in 2023. Dark Rebel Army is the most fleshed out part of the series in terms of representation it's got overall, but in terms of depth it's fairly basic. And that isn't a bad thing, as the Dark Rebel Army arc is a really strong start. I wouldn't have gotten into the series if it weren't for the comedic tone, heavy metal references, and great characters that make this arc as special as it is. Dark Schneider, Yoko, and the rest of the cast are hard not to get invested in, and really become the early hook for the series, even if the actual narrative remains fairly basic for these first 69 chapters. Another early strength of the series is Kazushi Hagiwara's artwork, and his excellent sense of humor. Clean, easy-to-follow panel layout makes everything a breeze to read through, and this early part of the series is just chock full of hilarious facial expressions. Genuinely still some of the funniest in any shonen manga. And all of the designs are fittingly late 80s heavy metal. Long waving capes and coats, leather straps and spikes everywhere, and big fluffy heads of hair. The character designs in the Dark Rebel Army's arc look like they would be right at home in Heavy Metal magazine. But the most noticeable visual highlight of the Dark Rebel Army's arc is the monster designs. All of which are classic Dungeons and Dragons. From the Beholder to Orcs and Lizardmen. Illustrated with a level of detail that's far beyond what you'd expect from a weekly Shonen Jump manga. And a very welcome element of all of these designs is that Hagiwara actively credits his assistants and monster designers on these pages. Kazuya Yaden, Hirohisha Suruda, and Heisagawa are all names that are dropped in helping Hagiwara illustrate the pages. Helping emphasize even from this early point that Hagiwara really respects his peers, and dislikes the idea of taking the credit for elements that he didn't handle by himself. And it really shows the passion that Hagiwara has for his work. Another way he illustrates this as well as emphasizes the comedy of the series, is by constantly leaving small blurbs and jokes on the borders of the panels, providing live ad-libs and mangaka commentary. It gives off a sense of vulnerability, and gives you a look into who Hagiwara actually is, in a way that's unusual but very amusing for a manga, and always gives the sense that at the end of the day, Hagiwara really is just taking the piss and having fun with this series. It's an excuse for him to reference his favorite metal bands, illustrate some awesome fights, shout out other successful mangaka like Hirohiko Araki, and crack some jokes with his audience. Some definitely at his own expense. The Dark Rebel Army's arc is a really fun start. It introduces the awesome cast that would further develop as the series went forward, and shows off Hagiwara's early sense of clear identity. And audience is agreed, as the Dark Rebel Army arc critically did pretty well, though commercially it was in a rather interesting position. That would put Hagiwara in a bit of a pickle, because unfortunately, within the pages of the weekly magazine itself, Bastard Chapters actually performed rather poorly, and it didn't help that Hagiwara, being the perfectionist that he was, would sometimes miss his deadline, leading to moments like in Chapter 51, where he couldn't finish two of the pages in time, so he just put two pages of text describing what was supposed to happen. Which yes, is a very funny way of working around being behind schedule, but it certainly annoyed the higher-ups at Shueisha. In most cases, this would lead to the quick cancellation of a series, but Bastard got lucky in how well its volume releases sold, definitely selling well enough to not justify cancelling the series, and making up for the fact that the actual magazine performance was somewhat lackluster. But between only really being successful in full releases, and Hagiwara's tendency to fall behind schedule, Bastard was proving that it didn't really work for a weekly format, leading it to getting a surprising and unprecedented treatment for a Shonen Jump manga. Bastard would be moved out of Weekly Shonen Jump, and would instead continue its run once every quarter of a year in the Shonen Jump seasonal specials, becoming the only manga that wasn't a one-shot to be featured in the side magazine. And it's with this new, quarter-yearly schedule that Hagiwara would have more time to work on each chapter, as well as making chapters far longer, which set the stage perfectly for the start of the series' second story arc, Hell's Requiem. The Hell's Requiem arc ran in the Shonen Jump seasonal specials from 1990 to 1992, with its first three chapters still being featured in Shonen Jump Weekly as a segue into the series' new format. By the time it had reached its conclusion, Hell's Requiem had taken place over volumes 8 through 12. Hell's Requiem is set some months after the events of the Dark Rebel Army's arc, opening with Dark Schneider missing in action, and Kal Su continuing his campaign to reawaken the Dark God Anthrasax. In that time, Kal has strengthened his foothold over the Kingdom of Judas, get it, nearly demolished the Kingdom of Ion Maide, get it, and has broken three of the four seals needed to reawaken the god. He's done this with the help of his personal militia, the Twelve Sorcerer Shogun. The only force truly trying to fight against Kal Su and his Sorcerer Shogun? are the samurai of the Fallen Kingdom Ayan Maide, led by the former Sorcerer General Kai Harn, 
who served her role as more of a side character and subordinate to Arshne in the Dark Rebel Armies arc. She just so happened to be one of Hagiwara's favorite designs, one that he loved so much that he wanted to keep using her in the series, giving her a more major role in this second story arc. And I mean it when I say Hagiwara really likes Kai Harn, like a lot, with Yoko tagging along to help in the fight as well. The Hell's Requiem arc started with the ballsy decision of not having Dark Schneider appear till its fifth chapter, meaning that the series ran for six months without the appearance of its main character. But this decision was great, as it gave plenty of time for Yoko and Kai Harn to develop further, giving the two plenty to do and essentially making Yoko the protagonist for the time being. It also helped open the way for the samurai of Ayan Maida and Kalsu's sorcerer Shogun to get a proper introduction. And when Dark Schneider finally does return, it's such a triumphant, satisfying moment that feels well earned. And after pushing back the sorcerer Shogun, Kalsu makes his way to the flying elven city of King Crimson Glory, leading to an incredible fight between him and Dark Schneider which serves as one of the emotional highlights of the series, and genuinely finds a way to pull at your heartstrings. Somehow in the midst of bastard self-aware nature, and absurdist comedy, Hagiwara finds a way to tell a genuinely beautiful story about the conflict between a master and his student, and it serves as a pretty perfect bookend to the Dark Rebel Army's arc, with the remaining chapters of Hell's Requiem focused on the rise of the newly awakened Anthrasax, as it sends its armies across the world causing destruction and death wherever they appear. It's around this point that some of the truths of Bastard's world and how it came to be are revealed, as well as hinting at Dark Schneider's connection to an ancient 400-year-old mech called the Dragon Knight, and it's on this note that the stage is set for the following story arc. But before I get to that, I have to acknowledge how much Hagiwara improved as an artist during the Hell's Requiem arc. With up to three months passing between each chapter, when a Bastard chapter dropped during Hell's Requiem, readers would certainly get their money's worth with singular chapters in the Shonen Jump seasonals running up to 100 pages at times. And within those pages, Hagiwara's already excellent artwork had been kicked up a notch, with him slowly developing his own unique style, character faces and bodies becoming sharper, more defined, and more exaggerated and distinct in their proportions, with suits of armor, weaponry, and monsters getting double the amount of detail that they did during the Dark Rebel Armies arc, and the series taking up some gorgeous, sweeping environmental shots. Bastard was starting to become a true visual feast, and Hagiwara hadn't lost his A-game when it came to solid panel layout and great comedic timing, with some of the funniest gags in the series taking place during this arc. The fight between Dark Schneider and Kalsu is also a masterclass in illustrated fight choreography, with every move made and spell cast practically rumbling the pages with their scale and power. Unfortunately, there is one small issue with the Hell's Requiem story arc, and that's that a few too many new characters are introduced at once, most of them being from the Twelve Sorcerer Shogun and the Samurai of Ayan Maide. In fact, out of the Samurai, only their leader Joshua and the youngest member, Vi, get any real necessary screen time. And for the Sorcerer Shogun, the members who get any truly worthwhile focus are McAlpine Tony Strauss, Ba Thori, Sheila E. Lee, and Yingve von Matstorm. And yes, all of those names are some of the most direct heavy metal references yet. These two factions feel somewhat out of place for now, at least. Mainly due to House Requiem being the shortest arc in the series, so there wasn't as much time to properly explore these groups. Which is a bit of a shame, since the Samurai of Ayan Maide were designed by Silent Mobius mangaka Kai Asamiya, and the Sorcerer Shogun were designed by Outlaw Star mangaka Takahiko Ito. At the end of the day, maybe these two groups were just an excuse for Hagiwara to get his friends to design some characters for his manga. And the real focus of Hell's Requiem anyway, is the conflict between Kal Su and Dark Schneider. And oh my god is the Awoken design of Anthrasax incredible, ending up being completely worth the wait, and setting the stage perfectly for what was presumed to be the series' final battle. Another welcome element of the Hell's Requiem arc is the introduction of a series of four coma comic strips and a series of two-page mini-comics, both titled Yagata Hagiwara, with these comics serving as the usual Ask the Author section of a manga, as well as being Hagiwara's place to take the piss out of himself and vent at the frustrations of being a mangaka, managing to create some great comedy and giving readers a really good, genuine look into the process of creating a successful manga as well as how stressful it can be. These comics would stick around for the rest of Bastard's run, and they give a look into who Hagiwara is, showing a sense of vulnerability and genuine adoration for the medium of comics that makes it almost feel as if you're reading one of your friend's scrapbooks. It's a dive into the artistic process that we don't usually get in long-running manga, at least not in a format this hilarious and easy to digest. And with Bastard still riding high in the Shonen Jump seasonal specials, the stage was set for the next story arc to begin, which just so happens to be the one that would change Bastard forever taking it from a hybrid of heavy metal music and Dungeons and Dragons to one of the most ambitious, beautifully illustrated, and insanely paced manga out there. This arc would run throughout the Shonen Jump seasonals from 1993 to 1996, consisting of volume 13 through 18, and it would be titled Crime and Punishment. From this point forward in the video, I'm mainly going to be talking about Hagiwara's evolution as an artist, as well as Bastard's characters and themes and why they work so well. 
because I do not want to spoil what happens in Crime and Punishment. Everything about the first four years of the series' run was building up to what Crime and Punishment had in store, and I would feel wrong for spoiling even a single plot beat that happens during this arc. But to still provide even a brief speck of context, Crime and Punishment begins with the climactic fight between Dark Snyder and Anthrasax finally taking place. This is it, the final battle. Everything the first four years of the series' run had been building up to. And this epic final battle concludes halfway through Volume 14. Hagiwara was now at the halfway point of his story. I'm just gonna leave that thought hanging as it is. Because an event takes place that's only really comparable to another legendary dark fantasy manga that would pull something similar around two years after Bastard's Crime and Punishment arc had begun. Crime and Punishment is the point where Bastard truly becomes Bastard flipping everything previously established on its head in a beautifully executed crescendo that sees the series both literally and figuratively go through a metamorphosis before your eyes. It's ballsy, jaw-dropping, absolutely off its rocker, and incredible to witness. And again, I don't want to talk about a single detail from this point going forward. But I do want to talk about the interesting publication history of this arc, and where it ended up leading Hagiwara and his team, Studio Loud in Session. Between August of 1992, and the beginning of 1997, Hagiwara and his team were busy, and much of that didn't actually have to do with the manga itself. While the six-episode Bastard OVA from AIC had also been releasing from between 1992 and 1993, Hagiwara on his own end began drafting ideas for a short story taking place before the Dark Rebel Army's arc. This story would soon unravel into a full novel-length tale called The Black Rainbow. But unfortunately for Hagiwara, being the perfectionist that he is, he put a lot of time into the ideas and concepts for Black Rainbow, even sketching up new characters exclusively for the story. And unfortunately, this got a bit in the way of the early parts of Crime and Punishment leading to the still quarter-yearly chapters being shorter in page count overall, with some even releasing with a regular Shonen Jump weekly page count of 20 or so pages. This left readers a bit hung out to dry, as now Bastard would only be receiving the equivalent of a volume and a half a year. And more delays hit as Hagiwara began to work on his first OVA, Baku in Campus Guard Dress, an OVA that would take up some of the time he would have otherwise used on Bastard throughout 1994. On top of this, Hagiwara's artwork was getting to a point where it was almost unmanageable, and not in the sense of it being messy, but in the sense of pages taking up weeks at a time for him and his crew to illustrate, in between all the other outsourced and commissioned work they had started doing at the time, with many members of Studio Loud in Session producing fully featured doujinshi and art collections on the side. And it certainly didn't help that the scale of Crime and Punishment was immense, Pages becoming absolutely packed to the brim with the detail on display, while keeping itself clear and easy to follow. Crime and Punishment took everything good in the Hell's Requiem arc and amplified it, leading to some absolutely jaw-dropping vistas, as well as upping the ante in terms of graphic violence, as well as taking a dive into being more of a black comedy when it comes to its humor, with Hagiwara contrasting the dark events of the arc with a great sense of referential humor that never feels like it's getting in the way of the actual events of the story, but is instead using these references to complement everything happening. It's an unhinged, lightning-fast story arc that throws so much at you at once, both in terms of its visuals and its narrative, that it can be a little overwhelming. But Hagiwara still manages to walk the tightrope of keeping readers engaged. Crime and Punishment is a triumph of action manga. By the time 1996 rolled around, as the Crime and Punishment arc had hit some amazing strides, another wrench was thrown Hagiwara's way. The Shonen Jump seasonal specials were going to be phased out, with the final special releasing in fall of 1996. With his regular quarter-yearly production cycle now killed off, Hagiwara would move back to Shonen Jump Weekly, but thankfully he would be able to secure a monthly schedule with the magazine, setting the stage for about 9-12 to 12 chapters to drop every year, a significantly picked up pace from where he had been at with the seasonals. Unfortunately, another disaster would strike, this time at the hands of Shueisha itself. Hagiwara would be ordered to abruptly cut off the Crime and Punishment story arc, concluding it midway through a climactic battle in the final issue of the Shonen Jump seasonal specials. With manuscripts for the remainder of the arc incomplete, and dozens of pages left unfinished, Hagiwara and Studio Loud in Session would compile all the work they had done for the remainder of the Crime and Punishment arc into a book titled Bastard Unused Revised. The book would dive deeper into Bastard's lore, the production process of the manga, and show off manuscripts and incomplete pages, revealing what was intended to happen for the remainder of the Crime and Punishment story arc. If I was to compare this book to anything, I'd compare it to Xenogear's Perfect Works, in it being used as a platform to share some of the unused ideas and elaborate on narrative elements that had to be massively cut back. So unfortunately, the fantastic Crime and Punishment arc does somewhat abruptly end, and once Hagiwara had moved back to Shonen Jump Weekly, a new arc would begin. Jumping ahead with a four-year time skip set after the Crime and Punishment arc, Bastard had made its glorious return to Shonen Jump Weekly with what would be its final major story arc, The Immoral Laws. 
Unfortunately for Bastard, having been out of Shonen Jump Weekly's rotation for seven years, the series returned and felt like a story out of time. Its far darker tone, irreverent comedy, and extremely violent and sexual content felt very out of place in the landscape of the magazine at the time. To give you a better picture of how long it had been, a little series you may have heard of called One Piece had started publication. All of the manga that were running parallel to Bastard when it left the magazine had since ended, and it was surrounded by newcomers. Not only that, but its loyal reader base didn't overlap particularly well with the younger crowd that primarily read Shonen Jump Weekly, leaving Bastard's releases for the next two years in the magazine to be sparse. With Hakiwara's health declining, and him often missing his new monthly deadlines, it was clear that the return to Shonen Jump Weekly wasn't working out as intended. But thankfully, there was another light on the horizon. In October of 1999, Shueisha would move its special Senin magazine, Ultra Jump, into monthly publication. With Ultra Jump containing far darker, far more sexual, far more mature narratives than what was featured in Shonen Jump Weekly, it seemed like the perfect new fit for Bastard. So in December of 2000, Bastard would move its publication platform once again, continuing its run in Ultra Jump. Hagiwara would get plenty of time in between chapters releases, now able to refine and perfect them to his heart's content. And as you've probably picked up at this point with the series, nothing is ever set in stone, and nothing ever works out consistently. Because in 2000, Shueisha also began to re-release Bastard, in a collected omnibus format, the Bastard Complete Editions. And Hagiwara, being the absolute insane madman that he is, decided that he would re-illustrate half of Volume 1 of Bastard and all of Volume 2, taking a full two years of his own time between 2000 and 2002 to complete this new self-assigned project of redoing all of his 80s artwork. Meaning that the release of new chapters was anemic, and this pissed Shueisha off, bringing them to give Hagiwara a smack on the wrist and force the remaining volumes of the Bastard Complete Edition to be regular re-releases with no redone artwork, forcing Hagiwara's attention back to the current Immoral Laws story arc. Though Hagiwara was beginning to run out of steam, as expressed in many of the Immoral Laws Yagata Hagiwara comics, the man was getting older and he was forcing himself to work harder than ever. Because when a chapter of Immoral Laws dropped, it looked like this. Usually I would try to find some way to at least verbalize my appreciation for Amanga's artwork, but every single panel of Immoral Laws looks this good. It's not even funny. Calling the story arc a triumph feels like it's underselling it. Nearly every page of Immoral Laws, especially near its later half, looks as if it belongs in a museum, and it's something you'd expect from a manga's key moment. Not every single panel. Hagiwara's perfectionism had straight up hit a level that had elevated him to being one of the masters of the entire industry, though he thankfully didn't lose his signature sense of humor, because the arc is still very funny, and he still finds creative ways to make gags out of unfinished pages that would later be refined in the volume releases. And between the signature humor of Bastard, as well as the incredible artwork, Immoral Laws is also the most emotional story arc in the series. And while I won't go into spoilers, as again it's a direct follow-up to Crime and Punishment, I will say that seeing Bastard go from a funny Dungeons and & Dragons and heavy metal hybrid, to a visual masterpiece that discusses the worth and value of human life and what we do with our time on the planet, as well as the value of our connections with those around us, is kind of nuts. Looking at Early Bastard and comparing it to Immoral Laws, the series is almost unrecognizable, and I mean that as a compliment. Very few series can get from that kind of A to this B, and still hold up under scrutiny. But Bastard didn't just pull it off, it pulled it off masterfully. And Hagiwara should rightfully be damn proud of himself for what he did with this arc. It should also come as no surprise, looking at the panels of this arc, to learn that it took a full 10 years to complete. Whereas the Dark Rebel Armies, Hell's Requiem, and Crime and Punishment all ran from between 1988 to 1997, Taking up 18 volumes overall, Immoral Laws ran from 1997 to 2008, consisting of volumes 19 through 26, with sometimes a year only receiving a single chapter. And Immoral Laws ends on a beautiful note, with Hagiwara pretty much having said everything that he needed to with this story. Though what had become the series' central conflict at this point had yet to be resolved, in some ways it didn't need to be, because the events of Immoral Laws found a way to answer that question that it posed. So from 2009 to 2010, Hagiwara would instead go back, back to the time skip from Crime and Punishment, and the unfinished content from his unused revised book, to use the rest of the manga's runtime to fill in that gap. This new continuation of Crime and Punishment would be called the Tomb of Spells, though the Tomb of Spells arc would only get five chapters, making up for one volume in total, which is volume 27. And it's why I don't consider Tomb of Spells to be a real arc. It's not even close to finished, and I don't think it needs to be. Because looking at the few chapters Hagiwara put out from 2009 to 2010, you could kind of tell that the man was burnt out. 
And after a moral loss, who could blame him? And much of the volume that exists consists of a long, drawn-out sex scene. You could really get a feeling that Hagiwara was exhausted. Though the volume does end on a really interesting note, I'd honestly be okay if this arc is never finished. Because part of what makes Bastard so unique is the experience Kazushi Hagiwara had creating the series. He put himself into this manga, and you can feel it through every page. And health-wise, he's doing a lot better now, doing a handful of illustrations for Capcom, and still working on a bunch of art books and doujins. The dude kinda just wants to chill and draw porn now. And honestly, respect. So aside from the last chapter of Tuma's Fells coming out in 2010, and Volume 27 releasing in 2012, Bastard's pretty much done. Since then, a spin-off novel starring the ninja master Gara has come out, and the new Leiden Films anime, directed by Takaharu Ozaki, began airing last year in batch releases on Netflix. But part of me wants to wait till that show's finished adapting the Hell's Requiem arc to actually talk about it. One, because I have some mixed thoughts on it overall, and two, because the 90s OVA from AIC had already been a fantastic adaptation of the Dark Rebel Army's arc as is. So I want to take the last stretch of this video to talk about the soul of Bastard itself. The protagonist who ties all of its other characters together, and one of my favorite shonen heroes ever, Dark Schneider. Dark Schneider, DS, or Darsh, he goes by a lot of nicknames, is the heart and soul of Bastard. And he's honestly one of the most distinct shonen protagonists in the magazine's long and storied history. Hagiwara did not want to create a typical hero for the magazine's young readers to relate to. He wanted to create someone deserving of being called a bastard. Dark Schneider is a braggadocious asshole, and a horn dog who thinks and often even fights with his dick first. When first awoken from Lucian's body, Darsh's first declaration is to conquer the world and take all of the women for himself. Creating a protagonist that readers can easily root for, while keeping them so actively scummy is a hard balancing act, but Hagiwara pulls it off. You see, all of that gusto is matched by a heart that genuinely cares for his allies. He's not the type who would ever utter those words out loud, but everything he does throughout the series' run, all the trash talk he throws at enemies, all the intense collateral damage he causes, and the copious amounts of sex he has, is all at the end of the day done to protect the people he considers his friends, keeping him right at home with other shonen protagonists. It just so happens that he actually knows what sex is, and is very, very obsessed with it. Part of his legitimately caring nature comes from his personality starting to overlap and meld with the young boy Lucian, whose soft personality and deep love for his best friend Yoko manifests in the form of Darsh claiming that Yoko is destined to be his bride and letting her be the only one to directly shoot down the wizard when he gets too rambunctious or foolish, essentially reducing him to a harmless little puppy. But just being loyal to his allies isn't a reason to root for a protagonist who's an abject scumbag, especially one that's 400 years old and openly talks about wanting to grope and fondle any attractive woman he runs into, regardless of what their age might be. Yoko is 16 at the start of the series, for example. So how does Hagiwara keep readers from wanting to see Dark Schneider locked up? Well, it's done through a mixture of Darsh's sheer charisma, and the fact that the series is actively poking fun at and punishing him for his constantly horny, pig-headed behavior. He's not getting beat up in a Master Roshi, haha, funny old man is a pervert kind of way, but in a legitimately funny, author actively breaks the fourth wall to roast his own main character kind of way. Straight up calling Darsh an enemy to all women. It also helps that whenever Darsh is trash-talking an opponent, he goes all in like he's spitting a classic wrestling promo, insulting everything from their face to their outfit and hairline, while propping up and boasting about how powerful and attractive he is. Watching this man's ego at work is a treat, and something that only really works for the protagonist of a semi-comedic action series like this. It goes without saying, but traits that can be obnoxious or unlikable in real life can really be a lot of fun in fiction. While most shonen protagonists are driven by willpower, loyalty, or ambition, Darsh is driven by sheer, unchecked raging hormones. A 400-year-old being who still acts like he's 18 at best, always looking to win a fight to show just how powerful he is, and hopefully getting some good sex after the fact. He's got some of the best dialogue you'll ever read from any manga protagonist. It often leads me reeling on the floor with laughter, cutting off long villain monologues with his foul mouth and powerful spells, all of which are named after heavy metal and rock bands. Anthem, Exodus, Guns N' Roses, Halloween, and Megadeth, just to name a few of the many metal magic incantations he casts and fights. Speaking of those spells, they're just as powerful as Darsh brags that they are. This is a protagonist who, despite still getting his ass beat on a fairly regular basis, is so comically powerful, in a way that the series is very aware of, that you stick with fights pretty much just to see what absolute nonsense he'll pull to win the next one. As I said, this is a dude who will fight without his lower body out of sheer anger that his dick is gone. And he's not a static character either, genuinely maturing over the course of the series as he discovers more about the truth of his origins and the secret powers hidden deep within him. He starts to show a softer side, still being that same scummy braggadocious asshole he started as, but one who genuinely appreciates and understands the human condition almost becoming a sort of saintly figure. And as we learn more about his origin, the title of the series being Bastard becomes a very well thought out double meaning. 
Dark Schneider himself, and much of the rest of the cast, really represents the worst of us. We can be terrible to each other, we can be evil, we can be cruel, but at the same time, we can be funny, we can be joyous, and we can be caring. And I truly believe that Hagiwara's point with Dark Schneider as a character was to display this. For as comically horrible as he is, he represents and plays out a mix of our best and worst traits as humans. And going off of where the story left us with immoral laws, this is definitely where I'm left reading his character, and what makes him such a special, unique shonen protagonist. Whenever I see people online talking about a horrible fictional man that they adore, Dark Schneider is the first character who comes to mind for me. And seeing as there's already TikTok thirst fan cams of him going around because of the new Netflix anime, I'd say he's still having Hagiwara's intended effect to this day. Dark Schneider is a bastard.